Let us pray. Gracious loving God, on this Memorial Day weekend, when we remember those we love, those who've served, those on our hearts who are with us and no longer with us, near and far away this weekend, we thank you for memories, for faith, and for all of those who guided us along the way. Open our hearts to your word anew this morning, that we might hear you speak to us words of hope, faith, and love. In your name we pray, amen. Well, we heard this morning so eloquently read by Jennifer, one of the most important, I think, scriptures in the Bible on faith. It's one of the most important scriptures also because of the example of the boundary-breaking capacity of Jesus Christ to proactively move, as he so often did, outside of the cultural, the religious, the national, geographical, and political boundaries that others tried to place upon him and the limitations so that he could meet all sorts of people and bless all sorts of people with God's love. Jesus was just as comfortable with rugged fishermen cleaning their nets and cutting bait along the seashore as he was a woman stopping at a well, rejected by her community, getting well at a late hour for her family, giving her living water, hope, and love, and grace just what she needed or perhaps welcoming a child into the midst, as we did this morning, these children who were baptized, saying, you're important to us, and welcoming them into dialogue with the group, and saying, you're a part of the kingdom just as much as the adults. Or when he challenged the political leaders or the religious leaders who are treating the people unjustly or ill-treating them, Jesus was always there, giving whatever word was needed for that day, for the hope and faith of the people. As a background for our text today, this Roman centurion that's mentioned would have been a career officer in the Roman army. He would have commanded a a century, or about a hundred soldiers would have been under his command, and whoever he told to go and do this, they would do it, and come and bring this, they would do it. They obeyed him, and his power and authority came from the Roman emperor. He was there to reinforce the collection of taxes. He was there to maintain order in the community. Some of the soldiers could be cruel to others in the community. Some of them could could be uh, repressive of the people. But this centurion mentioned today, as soldiers are different in personalities and manners and so forth, this soldier believed that he should treat those around him with compassion and care, both those under his command apparently, and also his servants at home. The version of this text in Luke also mentions that this centurion went to the synagogue and helped him support the synagogue. So this Roman centurion apparently was there to support the community, to build relationships, and to be there for the people. He seemed to be a very compassionate and caring person, perhaps even a God-fearer, as they were known in those days, who worshiped with those in a synagogue as well. Yet Jesus comes to meet with him, and the man comes looking for Jesus, and he asks him if he'll come to his home to heal his servant. Again, he's a person of great compassion. He doesn't see his servant as home just as a means to an end. He sees his servant at home as someone he really cares about and loves and and wants the best. Well, he comes to Jesus and asks, and he says, my servant's at home, lying at home, paralyzed, and will you come and heal my servant? Well, the man, apparently being a man of faith as well, uh, turns to Jesus, and he says, you know, you don't even have to come to my house, Jesus. If you say it's so, it's so. I have faith, and I believe in you, and what you say you will do, I will do, and I believe you will heal the servant of mine. And so he says, I don't have to see it happen to believe it's happening. I don't have to see every event that happens in life to know that God is acting in that circumstance, and by faith... He was saying, I believe you can heal him even from a long distance. Well, Jesus is astonished. He marvels, one scripture text said. He is amazed at the faith of this centurion soldier. He can't believe it that a soldier would believe that he doesn't need to come to his house to make something happen. He has such faith. He says, Jesus says to him, I've not found anyone in all of Israel who has such a great faith as yours. Get the point of that, not even in Israel, not even the people of God, the chosen people, those who followed Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Ruth and all the people that, that had students had studied for years and followed the teachings of the law, 
No one had faith as much as this Roman soldier. Yet this is an account not just about a miracle. This text and its focus is especially on faith. It's believing what we do not see. It's an important dynamic that God is transforming the world and working in unlimited possibilities of change and transformation. And God will choose to give the people the gift of faith no matter who God chooses to give it to. We, we ask for it, we seek it, we knock, we ask, but God gives us faith in all kinds of circumstances to all kinds of people in all kinds of different circumstances. God impacts life situations and faith is alive and well as it was with the Roman soldier, just as alive and well as it is with us today. Faith is belief and faith is trust working together. That God can bring about a miraculous physical recovery, we still that off, see that oftentimes today. We'll see people as we visit the hospitals in different situations and sometimes suddenly there'll be a turnaround and, and faith and prayers and, and participation with people often makes that difference. We see spiritual healings of the mind, of people and the soul and of the heart. We see physical healings in different ways. We see healings of different kinds of family differences, reconciliations that happen sometimes unexpectedly through avenues of human contact and other ways, or even divine intervention at times, bringing reconciliation in churches and communities, in nations, and even in our world. And even in the midst of grief and pain, we offer suffer in life, oftentimes through faith and hope God gives us a new beginning in life. Hebrews, I believe, describes one of the best descriptions of what this soldier experienced. In Hebrews 1, it says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for. This soldier had confidence in God in what he hoped for and the assurance about what we do not see. He was assured that even though he could not see it happen, he believed God was involved and acting and making a difference in a transformation of that life experience. Like the soldier, we cannot always see faith at work, but it is making a difference in our world today, especially in our own lives. It may impact the situation, but the difference it makes in our lives to have faith is one of the major impacts that it has. God is at work in our very midst as we open ourselves to new faith. And it, like the belief and the faith of that Roman soldier, as we mentioned in the book, of Hebrews. If you have time, read the 11th chapter of Hebrews sometime. There's so many different accounts in that one chapter of the book of Hebrews about people who had faith like Sarah and Abraham who went out on a journey. As we look back on it, we see what happened, but they went out into a journey that was completely unknown what would happen to them. But it says they went forward in faith. Or Moses, it talks about building an ark when there wasn't any rain yet but believing that God would see them through that situation. Or other men and women of the faith who acted solely upon faith. Wesley believed that faith was important to knowing God's love. And that love would then lead us towards holiness of living and the love for our neighbor as well and a deeper love for God. And that came through our faith. You may have read my blog this week. It was really fun and interesting writing it because it was a wonderful story that, from an interview that, that uh, those within our, our church, Leslie Laswell and others, uh, drew up several years ago. And Dr. Bill Longsworth knows these people very well. George Woodward, Jr., who had decided uh, during World War II how he would treat prisoners in an MP, as an MP in a POW camp in New Guinea in 1944. George was a member of our church, our congregation here. He's a volunteer at our First Street Mission. He was a Sunday school class member and a part of a Bible study class here at the church. But when he was called to go to war, he tried to go and put his faith in action, as many of our congregation did when they went into World War II. Our church gave our church members a pocket devotional that they gave to the soldiers as they went off, and we have one in the display case in uh, the hallway near the library, if you'd like to look at it that uh, was given to an Earl Smith in our congregation in 1944 to give him strength and faith as he went into the war. But regarding George Woodward, he was a volunteer here, active member of the church. He went to be a MP in a POW camp in New Guinea. And uh, there was an interview when he came back here in our church. 
He said, when he went off to war, one of the most important things was my faith. I did not know what I was going to encounter. I never knew what was going to happen to me or my friends and others that went into the war. But he said, I sought to have a Christ-like compassion despite the war I was going into. And my faith was the most important thing I had going into that unknown situation. When he was in the POW camp as an MP, he had to decide as a Christian how he's going to treat the prisoners there. There was cruelty and fighting and death all throughout that war, but he had to decide in that situation what did his faith mean for him in that, that time. Although these conditions were horrible, he decided that he would try to treat the prisoners as he would want to be treated himself with respect and with kindness because they were part of this situation with him. This was so much appreciated by the prisoners that they hand painted a flag on a, on a cloth for him and they gave it to George near the end of the war as gratitude for the way that he, they had treated him with them with respect and kindness. They all signed a flag. It has a description on it in Japanese that reads, the pictures drawn on the flag depict Mount Fuji, pine trees on a tiny island, cranes, and a boat sailing on the ocean. A typical Japanese scenery with gratitude and each one of them signed that flag. This must have been what they were longing for, those scenes, when they were in the, concept, in the uh, POW camp, camp. This flag is on display in our library hallway, if you'd like to see it, uh, and uh, take a look at it along with the companion book and so forth. It's an amazing flag, an amazing part of our history here that the archives and the library share with us. But George's challenges led to how am I going to respond in known, unknown situations with faith? I also had the opportunity last week to visit with Dr. Lamar Smith and uh, to talk to him a little bit. We were talking about World War II a little bit and his experiences, and Lamar's right down here this morning. He was sharing with me how he last year had gone to the World War II Museum in New Orleans. I did not know there was a World War II Museum in New Orleans until Lamar shared that with me. And when he went there, they were so interested in his story that they wanted to come back here to our church and interview him. They brought someone to interview him, the cameras, and set it all up. For an hour and a half, Dr. Smith went into sharing stories of his upbringing with his family in Mineola and other places, of his uh, four other brothers that he grew up with, Lamar being the youngest uh, brother of the five brothers, and shared stories of, of their childhood and their father and mother. Amazing stories. You can check out a copy in the library, take it home, and watch it for an hour and a half. Just amazing, transforming. And uh, Lamar was sharing about when the war came, how they all went into the war, his four older brothers and then Lamar himself. He talks about the amazing accounts of faith and of, of courage of all those who went in at that time. Most young people were, went in voluntarily or were drafted into the war at that time. He talks about the amazing accounts of his mother's challenge, having five sons, can you imagine five sons in the war in unknown various places around different countries and wondering what's going to happen to them. It took her faith in something she could not see to know that God was with them and, and helping them through all of that. She wrote letters to them every Sunday, all five of the boys. And Lamar, when he was boot camp, great son that he was, every day uh, wrote a letter home to his mother knowing the challenges that she faced having him and her five sons and him being in boot camp. On his father's uh, office desk or on the wall was hanging five stars, reminding him daily of the five sons who were fighting in World War II. One of Lamar's brothers, Glenn, had a near-death experience while they were flying. He was a photographer and they were taking pictures. And as they were flying over the ocean, they got too close to the, the water and one of the wings of the plane dipped into the, into the water and flipped the plane over. His brother Glenn almost died in that situation. He barely survived while some others did not in that crash. And, and Lamar, through all of that, talks about how close they got together with one another and how the faith they had to go through all of that together. He talks about how war can be hell. Yes, war can be hell. Wars always a last resort to resolving conflicts, as Lamar says. If we can do it peacefully, you know, and find a way to resolve our differences, it's always the best way. But we still have war today and, and wars happen. And yet, despite all of that, we know that 
that God is with those who go. God is with those, everyone involved. God seeks for peace with us all. Yet during that time, those that go and have the courage to go find that faith is one of the most important things of their lives that gets them through what they go through. Faith oftentimes in things we cannot see. Lamar shares a memory about a war buddy that he knew in boot camp that he just not long ago recently met at First Church Arlington through his son who was there and introduced them back to each other, someone he'd not seen for years since the early days of the boot camp. I hope you'll stop by and, and see the poster of some of our Wesley class uh, Bible partic or participants who served in World War II, others as well. This Memorial Day, we think of them and those who've died in the faith as well as our loved ones as well. Well, this weekend, we're bombarded with a lot of messages this Memorial Weekend. We're thinking about a lot of different things. We're thinking about family, those who've gone before. Some go out to decorate graves to remember and think of those if they're close enough to remember those part of our families. Uh, some of us run to the store to replace our eight-year-old mattress this weekend. Some of us trade in our vehicles for a new vehicle or a newer model or make our travel plans and reservations for the coming months or attend music concerts and enjoy grilling out with family members and those we love and care about. But one of the most important things, as Mr. Mark mentioned this morning, is to remember. Remember our family members and our loved ones who went before us, who instilled faith in us and lived by faith, even when they could not see what was happening. We do remember our veterans this weekend and those who served in the war. Those who do not start the wars, usually those who do not decide the policies and the political policies that determine going to war, but those who answer the call and have the courage to go forth. And we also remember today those, those family members who continue to inspire us with their faith. Our communion meal this morning, as Mr. Mark mentioned, is a remembrance. We remember, if you'll look in the liturgy this morning, how many times the word remember and remembrance is mentioned in the liturgy. We are remembering Christ's self-giving love and offering for us when we come to this table. We're remembering how much God has loved those generations going before us, how we are honoring Christ by remembering him today, and how we are also keeping this alive for this generation every time we have communion and for future generations to come. This holy table has been set for over 2,000 years now in various churches around the world. And we're doing it today as an act of remembrance and reliving that faith and that love that Christ brings to us today. A remembrance that keeps us alive, a remembrance that gives us faith, a remembrance when we kneel at this table, remembering that Christ's love and grace comes to us again and gives us new life this day. As one woman said, when I kneel at the communion table, I feel like God is hugging me every time I kneel at that table and loving me over and over again. The communion table is a place we remember, but it's also a place for us to remember those experiences of life we have. I was speaking to Jim Britton uh, this week, and he shared with me as we were visiting, he said, you know, the only thing that we can take from, with us from this life is our memories and our experiences and our faith. And that's what we have, and the people who are part of that with us. A favorite memory that I have, I want to share just in closing, is that uh, my wife Peggy and I have three granddaughters. And uh, one of my granddaughters is nine years old. Her name is Bella. And she lives in Phoenix, Arizona. And we love to fly her over here to visit once in a while. We're going to go see her in August once again. Well, Bella is a great little writer, and she was asked in her history class to share her favorite memory she has of, of all. And so Bella thought for a minute, and she wrote this paper, and I have a copy of it here if you'd like to see it later, the whole, entire version. <laughs> After you watch Lamar's video, DVD. <laughs> but when she flew from her home here to Phoenix, to Texas, to visit Grandma and Grandpa Chuck, she took a plane and she wrote, I love to go see Grandma and Grandpa, Peggy and Chuck. We took a plane, of course, to see them. Otherwise, it'd take two whole days of driving to get to Texas. I love flying because you get food and drinks and you look down from a high distance. They have a small lake in their backyard. We have a little small finger lake in our backyard. It's full of fish. So we go fishing, she says. I'm now a professional. I, 
I caught 12 fish last time I was there. My grandma likes to make us food. The toys are awesome, too. I hope you guys like my story. Bye. <laughs> well, you know, memories are important, and we keep creating memories. And even though I can't see my granddaughters today, they're in Phoenix, I know and I pray and I have faith that God is watching over them and everything they're doing and everything they're becoming until I see them again. I believe that faith is something important we apply in every situation in our lives. Amen.